All right, looks like we're just turning to four o'clock, so I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone uh, who is joining us on Zoom and on Facebook to our Thursday webinar. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, we'll just go through our usual introductions. Uh, oops, sorry. There you go. Uh, as always, we like to start with our land acknowledgement and acknowledge the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our campus sits. Our mission-related work is not possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. We are so grateful to all Indigenous people and our partners, and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Uh, our usual Zoom notice, please put your questions in the Q&A anytime during the presentation. Uh, that way they won't get lost in the chat uh, and we can make sure that we get those questions asked. If Zoom is giving you a headache, we are live streaming on Facebook and you can go back and see any of our uh, presentations on our YouTube channel. It is fabulous, so please subscribe. Uh, we have a really special webinar next week as well. Um, uh, it will be a pre-recorded kind of a movie uh, that we have made that some of our incredible staff, uh, Adam Kaxeter, if you know our staff, has has made with uh, Lyle Belenqua from Hopi. It is really unbelievable. So I'm I'm fortunate to be able to moderate it and please join us next week. Just a, our, a thank you, gratitude moment, huge gratitude moment uh, for everybody who came uh, in October uh, to the anniversary conference and just for everyone who joins our webinars, who comes to our programs, all of our friends uh, and partners, thank you so much. We are entirely supported by, uh, by your donations. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, Elvira Nowlin, who is a member of the Diné Nation. Uh, I'm going to just say a couple of things from her biography, uh, but let, um, let her introduce herself as well. Uh, she has shared with us that she was taught by her grandmother at a very young age, fabricating and designing jewelry. And this has been a significant part of her life. And her fondest memories were the days she sat under a juniper tree making jewelry with her grandmother. In 2016, she created the Instagram page Turquoise Mafia to share the jewelry that she made for her family and friends. And in 2017, it became a business. Creating affordable jewelry for those who honor and value the beauty of her Diné legacy is the goal. She hopes to bring joy to others one beautiful treasure at a time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I greatly appreciate this. Um, so hi, uh, my name is Elvira Nowlin. I'm in, I, my clan is, I'm Diné, and my clan is Deer Spring. I'm from a little place called Coppermine. It's about um, 30 minutes, or 30 miles or so from the Utah border. Um, Wait, I think I said that wrong. <laughs> but um, my clans are Bipatoni, Pachitni, Tobaha, and Maidesh. Okay. Um, so I will start um, with sharing a memory with you. When I was a little girl, my grandmother and I traveled from ceremony to ceremony every summer. This is how I learned how to make traditional dishes and how I how I made, learned how to make fry bread. The ceremony we attended is the enemy way ceremony, or as we know it in that. The ceremonies last about three days long, and the second night, the jinjay, was my favorite night. On the second night, we camped usually in the middle of nowhere. The cars were parked to form a circle, and a and a large fire was built in the middle. And after the sunset, the men would start singing and they would continue singing until morning. But also part of this night, we would, there was dancing. Oh my God, I'm nervous. 
<clears throat> so partners were chosen based on the relation. So the partner you chose would be somebody that is that wasn't the same clan as you were. And a lot of the times the partner would be apprehensive to go to the dance floor, but and then he but that person would start getting teased and then eventually they gave in because you were not allowed to say no. At the end of the dance, the partner who requested a dance received a gift, which was usually money. And we all kind of knew who was going to have the money because we all talked to each other and, and asked like, hey, how much money did he give you? And so we kind of sought out the people who were giving the most money. Um, as when the night grew, when it got darker, when my grandma and, other, and I got tired, she would make us a bed in, in the back of her pickup truck. And I would love, I would lie there staring at the stars, listening to the crickets, listening to the wind pass by and listening to my uncles and my grandfather, fathers singing songs. And that's how I usually drift into sleep. And in those moments when I was laying on the bed and just absorbing the sounds and the scents of the wood around me, like that was when, even as a child, I understood that that was a connection to the earth. That was a connection to the holy people. And at those moments, I would feel the most connected to the land, holy people. My And I really, it connected me to me, to where I knew who I was and what I was he, put here for. So we as Dana, we don't walk the path alone. We walk blanketed in our ancestors' prayers and the knowledge that they whisper in our ears and the holy people protecting and guiding us. My great-grandfather made necklaces that healed, and now five cent generations later, I continue to make jewelry with the stones, shells, and beads that have meaning and connection. Jewelry making has always been an inherent part of my life. It is something to show my love, and it's how I provide for my family. And the land where I call home, where my umbilical cord is buried, is the source of my inspiration. My favorite place in the world is my childhood home. Sitting on the front step, looking east, you'll see an old sheep corral made of wooden crates. And to the left, a large water bottle, a, a water barrel, a large trough, and a shiny sheep corral built with steel. And past that rock, Rocky Hill, you will see miles and miles of land, and off far in the distance, a gray, a small gray bump, Navajo Mountain. My family settled in this area after the long walk. And every year in July, descendants of Alvin and Loyola Sinanjini, my great, great grandparent, gather, celebrate, reminisce, and share stories of our perseverance with the new generation. And one of these, one of these stories shared is the story of a son dog, the, the family was gathered for a kinalda when soldiers came upon their, their encampment. When the men, the men faced the soldiers to protect the women and children, and the, men, and the women headed towards the canyon walls. The men couldn't hold, by the, hold back the soldiers, so some of the soldiers pursued the women. And while scaling the canyon wall, Asadok Ekhei was attached to her, her mother's back. And one of the bullets from the soldiers um, tore the thumb off of her hand. Now, Asadok Ekahi's um, mother, she and her mother did not make the, make the journey through the long walk. They were able to um, stay alive eating herbs or um, kind of even like berries from the land. Eventually, when the family returned, eventually the family did return, and Sandok Ekehi grew up and gave birth to two girls. One of the girls would grow up and give birth to my great grandmother Leola, who married Elvin Sinojini. Another story shared in those family reunions is how the clan name Deer Spring was birthed into fruition. Clan identity is vital in Diné life. The clan name Deer Spring originates from the Bitterwater Clan. My ancestors lived a, near a spring where Deer Spring had come to drink water. And one day, one of my ancestors came across a fawn 
the fawn's mother had died. She raised that fawn along with her sheep, and this is how I was told to receive the name Deer Spring. And I share the story because the clan identity is very important to Dine culture. It's like a blueprint and our identifier. When we meet other Diné in the wild, our clans immediately follow our name and a handshake. Uh, the women in my life were weavers and my great grandfather, Alvin Sinajini was a medicine man who healed with turquoise shells and made necklaces that protected and healed. Preparing for this webinar, I asked each of my aunts and uncles this question, how long has our family made jewelry? And the answer ranged from, ranged from I don't know, to from the start of time. My mother answered this question, sharing that my great-great-grandfather, Alvin, was a medicine man and a healer. I can't go into details, but I can say turquoise and shells are used in ceremonial settings to heal. The medicine man carved and shaped the shells and stones needed. In some ceremonies, a necklace is made for the patient. The necklace is blessed and given to the patient for protection and healing. And Alvin also made a lot of the jewelry for his family. My mom also shared memories from her childhood. Her grandmother, Lily Wilson, taught her how to bead and string necklaces. My mom, much like me, spent majority of her childhood with her grandparents. My, grand my great grandma, Lily Wilson, made beads from melting plastic, dyed corn, and cedar beads, in addition to working with turquoise and shells. And my mom said her mother didn't sell the jewelry. She made the jewelry she made for her family or gave them as gifts. And my grandmother raised her children with the money she made from selling rug the rugs she wove. And this brings me to my grandmother and me. My grandmother's name is Lily Bigman. And I am often heard, I'm often asked the question, how long have you been making jewelry? And my answer is always as long as I can remember. So my grandmother taught me how to string necklaces and bracelets to keep me out of trouble. I was a very wild kid. To give you an example, I brought a baby rattlesnake home because I was thought it was cute. Yeah, my grandma did, did not like that. And I would always come with scape and, scrape and bruises and one time with a cactus stu stuck to my butt. So to kind of keep me under, con to keep me con under control, my grandmother taught me how, how to string beads. She would give me a string and be like, here, make a bracelet. And I've just always done that. So the bracelets my grandmother and I would made, we sold them to the gift shop in Glen Canyon Dam. And my grandmother made her living by selling the rugs she made. And I remember seeing her when I was growing up, she would have to sit on a barrel to complete some of these rugs because they were so large. We didn't make much from the jewelry we made, but it was enough to put gas in the car. And then also a fun fact, if you visit the Glen Canyon Dam in the visitor center, you will see a Norman Walkwell painting of Alvin Sinogeny. He's standing next to his a horse and there's a little boy next to him. So one of the most important stones I use is turquoise. So Alvin used to use turquoise in his prayers and as an offering and for healing. Turquoise has a great significance to the Diné because it remember it reminds us of who we are and where we came from. The holy people of the Dine brought the turquoise with them from the second world. The Navajo Gracious story starts with an emergence of the first woman and men and woman to this world, the glittering world. And the Gracious story isn't something you can explain in a few words. It's something only shared in the winter and it's something that's not widely spoken about. But what I will share is the holy people brought turquoise with them from the second world. It's a reminder of our previous existence. And for us, Dine, we are taught that we must wear turquoise every day because it shows the holy people we are their offspring and to bless us and protect us. Now, so another, another saying that, I've, that I grew up hearing is turquoise isn't yours. It's something that is put in your care. And I want to share something with you. So this necklace, I made this necklace for my son. Um, 
about three years ago. So there's turquoise here and there's olive shell hishi, and then there's what we call a dot off the bottom. So the reason why we have the two strands is it represents male and female. Because a lot of Navajo is about balance. And then on the bottom here, this is called a dot off. So if you see this on the top, there is red coral there. So red coral represents the rainbow. So if you look at a rainbow, at the very top, you'll see red. And on that red is, um, red is really significant to us. We use it for our moccasins and we also um, have red paint when we do ceremonies. Now on the very, the very bottom, these are um, spiny oyster shells. Sometimes you'll see these and they'll have white at the bottom. And one of the, th and to add on the red coral here is, as Navajos, we believe that the rainbow, which the coral represents, is how we will journey from this existence to the next on that red path of the rainbow. So on that bottom with the spiny oyster, it's to show that shells are also very important to Jeanette culture. When white shell woman appeared, her cradle board was directly um, decorated with shells. And when I work with shells, I, I think of her. Shells were not used for jewelry. We used it in, we, shells are not only used for jewelry, we use it in prayers as well. So we will have an abalone shell and we would burn our cedar and our sage, or we would also drink water um, with, from it in ceremony of settings, and we also use it in our offerings. And then now off to my favorite thing to make jewelry with. So this here, this brown little bead here is called a cedar bead. It's nothing too special, just a, a round bead. But this little round bead holds a lot of, a lot of medicine. So as to now, we make these brown beads into bracelets or necklaces for our children to keep away bad dreams. My mom made me one when I was little, and her mom made her one when she was little. So how we make these beads here is that squirrels would grab the berry when it has green still around it. They would eat the outside, the green outside, and they would also eat inside and by making poking a little hole. So we would go to where the squirrel's nest is and using a stick, we would um, gather these cedar beads, um, these cedar seeds that were discar discarded and we would wash them and we'd pipe a hole in the other side and, and make them a bead. So just kind of on the cedar seed side, I wanna share a little bit about the importance of a cedar tree to us. So for cedar, cedar juniper berries, Juniper trees are very uh, important to us as Dine people. We would often, one of our, it's like a staple in, in most of our traditional dishes. So we would burn the leaves of um, the cedar trees and that ash, we would add it to our, our, our food. And it was a great, it's a great source of vitamins, especially, it's especially high in calcium. Um, one of the other things that we use them is we burn the cedar beads, the cedar the cedar branches to cleanse our soul, to cleanse our spirit, our mind. We also um, boil the leaves and sometimes the berry to make tea. Now this is um this tea is used in ceremonies to cure cure ailments, and the tea was used to cure the Spanish flu. And there's a little story my my uncle shared with me. So. Throughout the um, throughout the COVID pandemic, we also drank tea. It was something that we drank on a weekly basis. Now, um, one of the things I would like to stress is these when we pick these when we use juniper for our for our prayer purposes or to ingest. They're not. We don't just walk up to the tree and do it. There's a special prayer that we have to say, and a special way and and it's assigned to a specific person. 
So it's not something that, so if you were to go to up to Junior Green and just grab one, it may not work. Um, there's a special process that you have to go through. So this is what I wanted to share. This is something that is very special to me. So when I sit down and I'm making jewelry and I'm working with my shells and my turquoise, I am reminded that um, this is all about perseverance of my ancestors. And when I work with those shells and I can feel, I can feel the holy people, I can feel white shell woman through me as I make these pieces. I'm ready for any questions. Wow, thank you so much. What a really incredible, thank you. It's a huge um, honor to be able to hear all of the stories and the sharing of your memories uh, tied to those pieces. Um, thank you so much. I know it's very personal. <laughs> I don't, um, I wasn't expecting this, but oh my God, did I get nervous. <laughs> like I'm gonna do this, and then I could start feeling my 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 voice shaking, but I got through. <laughs> you you are spectacular. <laughs> um. Oh my gosh. Okay, so we've got a few a few questions coming in uh, about about the jewelry. Um, someone who uh who also um probably knows knows a bit about the raw materials uh asks uh spiny oyster and coral uh come from the sea are, are there some traditional trade routes and do the red shells uh represent water apart from the mist of the rainbow so for the spiny oyster yes there was trade routes um there was a when i when i hear these stories there were trade routes even with the aztec so a lot of the tribes had these, and I think I was seeing something a while back where they kind of, anyway, that's a side point. But yes, there was trade routes and that's how we got our shells. And sometimes you can find shells around the reservation. So if we're like rounding up cattle or just wandering about, we'll find shells on the ground. So I'm guessing that's probably left over when it was mainly water in this area. That's fantastic. Um, I'm sort of a little bit curious about about your business um, uh, and the the transition you made from from uh, creating your Instagram page to to the business of the Turquoise Mafia. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So um, I've always made jewelry for my whole life. So when in about 2015, I was a consultant and my and uh, my um, contract expired so when that happened I always carried shells and turquoise with me even when I wasn't um selling them and I started making necklaces for like my sisters my friends and uh and they're like oh this is really a unique style and I was like well I'm gonna open an Instagram page so I just kind of started sharing that and what I didn't what I wasn't expecting was um people following me and also people asking if I could make them something so that's where the transition happened in 2018. And also around that time, I was working in hospitality. And a lot of the times during the busy season here in Phoenix, I would be away from my kids for five, five, 15, 16 hours. And I didn't like that because they were still really little and I felt like they needed me. And I didn't want to wake up one day and be like, wow, I just missed out on, on their life. So um, at the time, my, my partner now, my fiance now, um, he said, why don't you just focus on them? Like sell jewelry and just be there for the kids. And that was a really wonderful thing for me because I've got his support and I was able to be there and, and really spend that time with my children. Oh, and that's wonderful. Turquoise Mafia grew the most during the pandemic. It was almost oh. like every day there was there was dozens of new followers and so that was um that was a big big thing for me just this tiny little page I started to share the jewelry I made blew into something a little bigger it's wonderful I'm sure that you brought a lot of joy to people during the pandemic who were able to able to share in that um Becky did you have a question yeah I do so you know as you went, you know, like five generations for um, learning how to do your jewelry. 
is there a certain style that your family does that when people look at it and like, oh, this is this is Elvira's work or, you know, part, part of the family, you know, so is there designs or, or, you know, part of that technique that you use that's uniquely your, your family? Um, I'm not sure we have a technique that is, that is um, uniquely my family, but what I will say is I make jewelry a specific way. And so often people will not recognize something I made or something that was made by other one, depending on how I tie the meaning so this is what this is how I make the jewelry. I make it out of artificial sinew. I always tie a turquoise on there. And I always tie a cedar bead on there. And I do those for specific reasons. One the turquoise for prosperity and then the one cedar bead for protection. So that is something that um, most identify the jewelry I make with. Um, that's, but I don't, I don't have anything specifically for the family. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I when I um, left high school, that was one of the things that I wanted to do was be a jeweler, and you know, just cutting the stones was probably one of my favorite things. And you know, I do. I do stuff, but I do it all by hand, and so I grind it by hand, and and just make little things and stuff, necklaces and other stuff. So yeah, you know, jewelry and turquoise. I mean, just you know, is there a favorite uh, kind of turquoise that you like? Favorite kind of turquoise I like. Um, I like things that are a little greener, something that looks like it's been aged. So. The type of green turquoise usually with more green is usually located neither um, south um, in like the Sonora area or Nevada turquoise. And it's always the very, very bright ones. I just love, I just love them. They're, they're beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I know. There's always those favorite types of turquoise that you have, you know, that that they're kind of amazing. You're just like, oh. but are you finding that it's getting harder and harder to find? Definitely. I think majority of the turquoise out there is um, treated turquoise, which is okay. It's still turquoise. Um, but finding natural, natural untreated turquoise is getting a little bit, a little more difficult and a lot more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, turquoise is, is always, you know, what, what, what type of turquoise have you found? to be the hardest to, to cut or do you, do you cut your own stones? Um, so I, I'm getting into the lapidary work. It's not something that um, I'm completely, uh, it's something that I'm still learning. Now, one of the things I noticed is that, especially American turquoise, it's, that's mostly what I use, but American turquoise is soft. It's, and you have to be really gentle with the way use it and that's also a big thing that's different from de um, American turquoise and Japanese and Chinese turquoise is um, American turquoise is soft and it's easy to break it so that's just um it's like a it always astounds me how fragile turquoise is yeah and and so when you sell your turquoise or your jewelry where where do you sell it at just okay. so yeah so I sell a lot of my jewelry online um, through my website, turquoisemafia.com. But I also do travel to like um, powwows and I also sell them at markets. So I was at a, a market not too long ago in Oklahoma City. It's like the ATALM conference. I don't know if you guys, if you ever attend that. That was the last conference I attended. Um, and then this weekend, I'm setting up at a market in Flagstaff at the Twin Arrows Casino. So just kind of finding these fun things to do. And for me, the busiest time is right now. Uh, because yeah. holidays. Yeah, holidays and here in the here in Phoenix, it's when we have beautiful weather. No, right. there's a lot of outdoor activities. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, yeah, I've always yeah I would like to you know eventually meet up and meet you and and see what you have for me i'm excited i love jewelry <laughs> yeah. we have a, a couple questions maybe some uh 
uh, prompted by the the beautiful necklace you're wearing, which our folks are interested if, if that's one of one of your uh, pieces, and uh, if you collaborate with any silversmiths. Okay. Um, well, this particular necklace is a gift. This um, necklace is a gift for my fiance. Hmm. Ash is like my favorite necklace to wear. I just hmm. so it's not a, it's not my own piece. Now, as uh, collaborating with silversmiths. Um, I wouldn't know if that would be a collaboration, but a friend of mine, he's a wonderful and my favorite silversmith. I hope my uncles are not on here. Um, his name is Nicholas. The name, uh, and he has the company called the Silver Artichoke. So a, a few years ago, I would make necklaces for the pendants that they would make. But my dream is, I do have uncles as silversmiths. My dream is to eventually do silversmithing as well. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful aspiration. Um, the the audience uh, really loved the stories about uh, special jewelry pe special jewelry pieces for certain people and occasions. And and we have a question if uh, if there are other uh, special pieces that are for specific purposes, um, if you're allowed uh, or are comfortable talking about them. Uh, yes, one of the um, my son loves jewelry. My daughter not so much. So because my son loves jewelry, I love um, making jewelry for him. And then I, I love going out there and, and shopping for jewelry for him. So one of the significance, um, one of the jewelry pieces that have great significance is it's called like Etzel or a Bogard. And it has a little turquoise in the middle. Um, that's the one I can think off of the hat, um, my head. And most of it, um, so that's something uh, that would be given to to a very young man and then eventually as he grows up he'll get another one and he grows out of that one that's wonderful great story um well that kind of leads to another question we have about uh, uh what are some of the inspirations um for your design you, you talked a bit about um how they've tied into certain cultural stories and cultural history and uh is there any more you can share with us about that hmm. Kind of thing. No, don't take it. Just take a minute. <laughs> Can you repeat it? Oh, uh, where do you get the inspirations for uh for your for your jewelry for the designs that you use? Old photos. Oh, oh really? That's a that's a big one. Um, I love to look at old photos, even for my own family. I love to look at. I will like zoom in. And like look at these photos I would find on the website of like um of like old Navajo men which is my favorite um that's a huge inspiration for me and I will and look at the jewelries it's just that's that's a big one for me so one of the one of the, the jewelry pieces I created from um old photos is a little hoop with a tiny turquoise hanging down um my son is growing out his hair for to make a, a bun and so to go with that, I made him a pair of earrings that I seen in those photos. So now I got him a little tiny hoop with a little turquoise and then he's worn that for probably almost two years now and never takes it off, showers with it. So that's one of the, the pieces that, uh, that I, I got the inspiration from photos. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, kind of uh, leading off of the the piece that you made for your son and saying that your son loves jewelry and your daughter not so much. One of our viewers asked, uh, uh, "Is there a, a real demand from men for your jewelry, and and what kind of jewelry are uh, do your male customers tend to tend to prefer?" Mm, most of the most jewelry is unisex, so. And now like one of these necklaces, um, you will see them for men or women. But what I did know that men like is more of like the chunkier, um, heavier turquoise necklaces or mm -hmm. um, something like a graduated he, she turquoise necklace is something that men would use. But again, that's also universal. It can be used by men or women. Um, Fantastic. I really I, I love, oh, go ahead, please. I was gonna say, I, I really don't see a difference. Um, just kind of there's not really there's to me there it's equal 
it's not a demand one way or the other. That's wonderful. Is that um, is that somewhat traditional, uh, or that uh, other other jewelers uh, in artists in your family kind of have the same sense of of jewelry being unisex? Yeah, definitely. Like the there's there are a couple pieces which are specifically for men, which is the the gadol that I I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so one of the things you mentioned uh, uh, in your in your bio and in in some of what you had shared with us um, uh, is your your passion for creating uh, affordable jewelry for people and. Uh, we've all noticed that there can be some really, um, really expensive uh, jewelry that uh, may be limited into the people who who would be able to enjoy it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, why that's your passion or if there are people that you wanted to make sure would be able to enjoy? Um, yes. So I, um, I graduated from high school here in Phoenix. And one of the things that I noticed with other Dina um, people is when we would we would dress up a lot for special we would just dress up a lot for special occasions and also for um, one of them being our the graduation. So um, because of the history of my family having jewelry, I would always have jewelry from head to toe. But mm -hmm. other Navajos who grew who were urban whose family didn't have the family I had, it was a little difficult for them to have these pieces. So instead of having like a necklace that's made out of like Real turquoise will have something made with like howlite or plastic. And then also they might even not even be able to afford that. And mm -hmm. that is something that was that is really important to me is that I make jewelry for people who so I try to make jewelry for everyone. And that's mm -hmm. that's my goal. Spectacular. But we're all everyone is very lucky. Um uh, Becky, would, would you did you have another question? Sure, I was just wondering about like, did you have a couple of kids, and and are your children interested in in the jewelry business? My son. Nice. My son has made some some jewelry. That's cool. So you're just passing it on. That's that's awesome. Yeah, so and my my daughter does too, but she'll do something more like mainstream. And she'll do it until she really, really wants money. So. That was a motive. Are you using some of the some of the same uh, techniques that your your grandmother helped you with to teach your son? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything like, in specific? So with anything, um, as Navajos, we're everything comes like a story to us. We like to talk, and we like to. Uh, <laughs> Um, overshare, which I think is is a lot of what <laughs> what to net people. Um, so when my when I would sit there sit, teaching my son, it would be like, hey, you know what, this turquoise um, uh, means this, or and then kind of going elaborating on where the turquoise may have come before um, Europeans came here, and so just kind of telling stories with these things, similar to what my grandmother did with me. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, you know, it's really important, you know, when you um, have have those stories and you pass it on it, but it's also part of that connection of of you and with your children and, and tying that the turquoise and and putting it all together culturally with with your children. And, you know, it's part of knowing who you are and where you come from. It's, it's important. Yes, and my son is um amazing. I think the new generation is actually pretty amazing. Um, but my son is is amazing to me because he is deep in his bones, proud to be Navajo. Um, he loves the land. He loves absolutely everything that comes with being a Diné person. Hence, like him growing out his hair. Although we live in um, the city, and he's and. To kind of a to to go um on that is I asked him when he grew his hair and I was like, well, what are you gonna say if you're bullied? What are you gonna say to somebody who bullies you about long hair, your long hair? And he and he just looked at me and he's like, well, I'll tell him it's my tradition. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I asked him the same question when I 
made them the earrings because they're not something that can be hidden. They're very, um, especially when he ties it back there, you could see them, they're right there. And I was like, what do you can say about somebody who has your earrings? And he's like, and I'll be like, I'm Navajo. This is what we do. And so that's something that is beautiful to me because growing up, um, I really didn't see that. Uh, it wasn't something that well, I seen a lot of people giving, taking pride in who they were, um, myself included. So growing up um, as a Diné, um, I grew up with my grandparents. So I spoke um, Navajo all the time. It was probably my first language. And so when I moved to Flagstaff, um, I was made fun of uh, for my accent. And it didn't feel good. So I spent one whole summer reading books out loud to get rid of it. And, and I regret that because I now speak majority in English and there's a lot of words that I've forgotten how to pronounce. Um, and to see my son being so proud of who he is and wanting to know about his Diné, his Diné culture is just beautiful to me. It's like, yeah, you go, spread the word. <laughs> That's fantastic. We've, we have uh, had the had the good fortune to work with um, some Navajo uh, silversmiths and jewelers that have also passed things down, uh, the, the tradition down to their children. And I uh, uh, sometimes it seems like the children will take some of the traditional methods and then add uh, their own kind of modern spin on it. Do you, do you sense that uh, that your son will will follow more in your style? style footsteps or that he has some of his own uh unique personality to add to his jo his jewelry making he has his own personality <laughs> i think that's something also that is important in the of uh, the in um of how jewelry evolves there's some things that i use now that weren't available to to my mom or my grandma and it's just kind of adding on to to that i think growing is is really wonderful about it it's beautiful just beautiful oh. you mentioned that um that you're a storyteller and you like to to overshare uh is there or have a tendency to overshare and I don't think there's any such thing I'm the worst oversharer in the world um is there are there is there any uh a story about about your craft or, or your family or your history that uh, that you haven't shared with us yet that you might want to share before we before we end end the presentation yeah, I seen a question here in the Q and A. It says, "Is turquoise mined from rock in the Southwest? Do you mine it yourself, or do you have a source you get it from?" So I will answer that question along with this one. So, um, when I was having the discussions with my my auntie yesterday, one of the questions I had asked her was like, "Hey, you know where we got the the turquoise from?" I was like, "Was it just from South Southern Arizona and uh, New Mexico?" And what she said was. No, we live um we live in a near a copper mine and not far from there, I don't remember the name off the top of my head. She said that's where we got emotional. Most it's closer to Grand Canyon in that area is where they would have turquoise. And I wish I had remembered the, the name that she um she said. But there she said that the turquoise would just be lying on the ground. Um so so that is something that was that was available to us within within our um our homeland within the this few hundred miles of our home um and also one thing i wanted to share too um off of that is for dinner um we're we're told not to go digging for turquoise i know majority of the mines um have turquoise that dig for the turquoise but traditionally we are told not to dig for turquoise that we should just take stuff from the from the top because that's what is meant for us to have. Oh wow, that's a, that's a wonderful tradition. Wow. Well, I think uh, I think everyone has asked their questions. I just have a lot to reflect on from your presentation. We're really grateful to have you share your stories and your family uh, with us. Um, and we really hope we get to meet you in person and everyone check out her website. I, I had to sneak a peek at it while uh, well, while we were while we were talking, and just some absolutely gorgeous uh, pieces there. We're just really, really proud to have have been able to get to know you. Uh, Becky, did you have something to say? 
Yeah, no, I just wanted to say thank you. You know, I, it's always great to to have other um, Native artists and to to know about the you know what you do and how how deep and you know it is within your family and to know you know more about you know you and and I love the name Chroma um, Turquoise Mafia. You know, it's it's, <laughs> it's it's different, but yet it's also catchy, and you can see why people are like, oh, I wonder what that's about. So so that's cool, um, and I really like the fact that you know. It's it's always amazing when when you know you have you and your your daughter and your son and you know just being able to pass down that knowledge, but then also that story and the history of of who you are and where you come from is really important. And then that that way, you know, that's why your son's so proud to be who he is, is because you're passing down that knowledge to him and it's awesome. So thank you for taking your time. And I know that, you know, you've done some other interviews with, you know, other, other paper and, you know, I mean, magazines and, you know, it, it's, so it's awesome. So thank you for taking your time, you know, to, that you gave to us. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you so much for being kind. I, I appreciate that. I felt really nervous going through and I didn't expect for all the words to disappear when I started talking. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. And also, um, I want to say this is the first uh, big um, talking I've ever done. I've been invited before, but I was always a little scared. So when I had received that in email from, from you and I was like, well, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. I might completely blow it and fail, but... I'm gonna get my toes wet here. So thank you for this opportunity. I I, re I greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Well, you're natural and you're just spectacular. Uh, and as, as you can see in the chat, everyone is just uh, saying lots and lots of compliments and uh, we would have never known that this was your first time. So we're very honored to be your first uh, big public presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and we hope that, that you'll come back again in the future. I would love that. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elvira. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.